Researchers have discovered four types of parent styles. These different styles are dependent on what the parent feels the child needs from them. Types of parent include authoritative, authoritarian, permissive, and uninvolved. Authoritative parenting involves high expectations of children, which is largely supported and enforced by the parents of the child. This form of parenting has been said to be the most beneficial parenting style due to its large emphasis on open communication with the child. Authoritarian parenting can also be identified as strict parenting. These particular parents tend to be demanding and not responsive. Open conversations will be rare and rules and expectations will be set out clearly for the child to follow. However, if these rules are broken, punishment will follow. Permissive parents are responsive, yet not demanding and on the contrary, rather leaning toward their children in order to avoid confrontation. Neglectful parenting typically involves parents who do not take an interest in the child's physical, emotional and other needs. They also do not know what is occurring in the child's life and often leave their child alone. Authoritarian parenting is generally the type of parenting which is used within Chinese families. The term which is given to the mothers of such family is a tiger mom. Tiger moms are perceived to be highly controlling, strict and severe, almost to the point of abuse. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear tiger mom? It's like tough. Overbearing. Fierce. Like no nonsense. Strict. Strict as hell. I think of my mom. My mom? Um, my mom. A little bit of my mom. I had a tiger mom, 100%. A tiger mom is an Asian American mom that holds her kids to really, really high standards. The most important thing is being smart and doing well in school. My tiger mom was essentially just always, um, always pushing you to be excellent. Actually, they expect more than the best from you. They, they, they have an ideal of what you should be, and you should meet or beat it. If it's an A minus, why don't you get an A? Um, or if I got 100%, I should be like, did, was there no extra credit points? You know, she chased me with the broom one time down the street because I wasn't doing my homework. If I wanted to go out with my friends, I'd have to request to go out a month in advance. I had to do this math test or whatever, and then if I didn't get every question correct, I would have to do it again, and it was like 100 questions. You know, I know plenty of people who kind of endured that tiger style of parenting. I did not like having a tiger mom when I was little. It made me very angsty, especially as a teenager. I guess there were moments when I felt like, oh, come on, man, I, I did my best. I mean, when you're a kid, all you want to do is you want to play outside. Play video games, watch Pokemon, like, didn't really want to work that hard. Now that I'm older, I definitely appreciate the way my mom raised me. I think my mom raised me this way because she didn't have the opportunities growing up herself to have a better education and be the person she wanted to be. It ultimately comes because of love. You know, they love us so much that they want us to do the best. Now I do realize that back then, um, she would have been proud of me regardless of the grades that I, that I got. Thinking about it as an adult, that's love. It's tough love. The older you get, you realize it also has a lot of benefits having a tiger mom. Um, it kind of instills you with a really good work ethic. I'm such a better person for it today, and my work ethic and my drive today is all thanks to her. Ultimately, do you think that you'll become a tiger mom? Yes. <laughs> uh, probably. I'm probably going to be like a semi-tiger mom. With my own son, I'm actually a tiger dad. I think I'm going to become a tiger mom because that's the only way I know how to raise a child. <laughs> Relating to tiger moms, the concept called filial piety is a central value within the culture of Chinese families. This concept means that children should be respectful of both their parents and grandparents for the entity of their lives. Children must let their elders decide aspects such as which college they go to and what career path they will also follow. At one time, disobeying the parents' decision was seen as a crime in Chinese culture. Chinese parents typically raise their children not to be independent, but to be integrated into the family this way, family can depend on each other rather than relying on the outside help.
Marriage is a key example of this, as when a couple marries, the son is expected to remain in his parents' family even after marrying, while the daughter is expected to join the family of her husband. Women are also often expected to marry men of higher social status than their own, usually someone either more educated or older. Comparing these traditional values to that of the modern day, the failure of the state to provide adequate childcare, despite the strong emphasis on women's employment, has resulted in a strong pressure to find solutions within the family. It is believed to have lengthened the period of extended family living for the average younger couple. Although it is important to learn that newlywed couples traditionally moved into the husband's parents' house, which was often filled with relatives and stayed there for some time, it is also important to learn that cultural changes in regard to attitudes have changed. Changes in the marriage laws made by the Communist Party after it took power gave newlywed couples more freedom from their parents by allowing them to set up their own households and not be required to move in with the groom's parents. Although these changes are present, it can still be seen that extended families still live together in rural areas. A typical family of nine in rural southern China is made up of two aging parents in their 50s, their two sons and their two sons' families, which is usually two wives and three children. The adults in the family work an average of 30 hours a week in the family fish breeding business. Sometimes five generations live in a single house and a whole village belongs to the same family. One Shanghai family with 115 members applied for inclusion to the Guinness Book World Records. These days, most urban households contain parents, usually one child and sometimes a grandparent. Large families are relatively uncommon because of the one child laws and lack of space. The housing shortage is so severe in Shanghai, couples postpone their marriages because they can't afford a place of their own and girls dump boyfriends if they don't have access to an apartment. The one-child policy was designed in 1980 as a temporary measure to put a break on China's population growth and to facilitate economic growth under a planned economy that faced severe shortages of capital, natural resources and consumer goods. The policy only ended one year ago in January 2016 and now all Chinese couples are allowed to have two children. This marks the end of China's one-child policy, which has restricted the majority of China's family to only one child in the last 36 years. <laughs> From great-great-grandmother down through five generations, this family is a perfect example of China's population crisis. There's only one great-great-grandchild. It's a story of pain and loss that could be told at hundreds of millions of dinner tables. I did fall pregnant for a second time, Jiang Xinping tells me, but I had an abortion. Did you have a choice? I couldn't keep it, she replies. You either go willingly or the government comes for you. Ru Dong in eastern China was once given model status for its strict enforcement of the one-child policy. Now though, in terms of age profile, it is the oldest place in the country. Gao De Chuan is one of many growing old alone here. His only son lives far away, but he'd have two more children were it not for the abortions his wife was forced to undergo. My biggest concern is what will happen to me when I can't look after myself, he tells me. With its early adoption and strict enforcement, the county of Rudong has been emptied of its children quicker than anywhere else in China. And as it grows old, it now stands as a stark warning about the disastrous economic consequences of the one-child policy. There have been changes. The number of exceptions to the rule have increased, but so far China's national leaders have stubbornly stuck to it. That, though, might be about to change. China's population obsession can be traced back to Chairman Mao, becoming national policy after his death. As his modern-day successors work on the latest five-year plan, there's wide speculation that the one-child policy will finally go. The earlier, the better, and the, the more favorable 
to the social economic development. I'm uh, fully sure they'll be including the the plan, five-year plan. But critics say even a two-child policy won't boost the birth rate enough. And for women who want more than two, of course, it won't end the brutal control of their fertility. John Sudworth, BBC News, Rudong. What's happened today is that the Chinese Communist Party has announced that Chinese couples, wherever they live, countryside, cities, whatever ethnic background they're from, Han Chinese or Tibetan or Uyghur, whatever, they can have two children and that is a huge change. Before today's change, the rules were really complicated, but to simplify, if you lived in a Chinese city, and that's now the majority of Chinese people, you could only have one child. If you lived in the countryside, you might be allowed a second if your first was a girl. The reason for the change is the Chinese government's increasingly concerned about having an ageing population. It's afraid that China is going to get old before it gets rich and that that may mean that it never gets rich at all. So it wants to encourage people to have children. It's hard to say whether it will work because Increasingly, Chinese families find having children extremely expensive. They invest a lot of time and a lot of money in their offspring, and it's a very competitive school system and competitive labour market. So a lot of middle-class aspirational parents look at this change and may say, I can't afford a second child anyway. In China, children start primary school when they are six years old and preschool at the age of three. The school day is much longer than that of the UK. It will often begin as early as 7.30 in the morning and last through to four or five o'clock with homework to complete as well. The children learn Chinese language and literature, mathematics, PE, art, music, English, and also have moral education and ethical lessons. The classes are large with as many as 40 or 50 pupils. All pupils take part in group exercises every morning in the sports ground and have a flag raising ceremony where they sing the national anthem. More than 45% of pupils spend up to four hours a week in after-school lessons in mathematics. An additional 20% more pupils in Shanghai spend more than four hours a week on maths, English and Chinese classes. Usually, this is not the end of the learning day. Once pupils come back from their tutorial, they often have to complete their homework before they go to bed. According to a recent survey, pupils in cities are facing problems of sleep deprivation. For a lot of Chinese high school students, boarding school type education is an even more time consuming form of education. Students start their day at 7.30am for a reading session. For the next 20 minutes, they will repeat a few words in Chinese or English with their class teacher. There are two exceptions to this start of the day. Five students per class are selected to clean the classrooms. Those students will start at 7am to mop the floors and clean the campus before returning to class. The other exception concerns students that have performed badly at their previous exam. They will start at 7.25 and read different subjects depending on how bad their score was. From 7.50 to 10 past 10, students follow normal classes of 45 minutes. They will have three of them before going on a break. At 10 past 10, the bell rings and depending on the weather, students need to go to the local stadium to start a routine. On Monday, they will, with their teacher, salute the flag. The rest of that time, they will run and perform dances and push discipline. From 10.40 to 12.10, students get two classes before a lunch break. The lunch break will last up until 2.30, but naps are encouraged around 1pm to keep students in good shape. At 2.30 to 5.45, students get the next classes, a total of four classes before their dinner break, that will last up to 6.30. At 6.30pm, students get back to their classrooms to study classes. Depending on their teachers, they might start work on their homework, get some tutoring or simply get a few more classes. Students then finish classes at 11pm and then go to their dormitories. This is the usual schedule from Monday to Friday. On Saturday, students finish school at 4.45pm and on a Sunday they start at 6.30pm. 
Weekend is therefore not a very well-known term for these Chinese high school students. When compared with the daily routine of a typical child living in England, it can be seen just how much of a difference there is between English schooling system and the Chinese schooling system. A typical example of an English child's school day starts at 7.30am when the child wakes up and begins to get ready. At 8am the child has breakfast with their family. At 8.45 the child leaves for school. Until 10am the child takes place in a morning art lesson and a drama lesson where they practice dancing. At 10am the child works on their practice SATS tests. At 12am the child has their lunchtime with the rest of their friends. This break gives the child a chance to socialise and play with their friends. After lunch until 3.30pm the child practices and lessons until they finish school and partake in activities with their friends. At 6pm the child will have their lunch with their family. At 7pm the child plays and does activities which they want to do. At 8.30pm the child finishes their activities and goes to bed.